How you doing, Justin? Here today we are checking out one of the all-time great pop punk songs. It is "Basket Case" by Green Day. I must have played this song a thousand times or more in bands as a teenager and in my twenties, like pub rock bands. It's great fun to play, full of energy. I played it wrong for most of my life. It's not until I did this lesson I really sat down and tried to kind of make sure that I got the bits right. And there was loads of stuff that I thought I had right that I wasn't quite there on. And I'm going to try and show you kind of a simple way to do it, like the way that I was doing it for a long time, and show you the right way with some of the nuances that I think make the track sound just right. The first thing to mention is that it is in E-flat tuning, so you need to tune each string of your guitar down by one semitone. Now this was the first big mistake that I made, because I always just played it in E-flat, so I played it on regular tuning to sound like the record. Because of doing that, I wasn't using any open chords. And actually listening back to it now, it's like, how did I not notice that they were using the open chords? Because it's really obvious. Uh, but again, that's one of those things, like unless you're listening for stuff, it's pretty easy to miss that sort of thing. So we're going to be playing it. If, uh, if you want to play along with me in this lesson, you want to play along with the original recording, you need to tune your guitar down by one semitone or stay in regular tuning and use a software option to move the original recording up one semitone. That works too, but for me with this lesson, you're going to have to tune down. Very easy. Literally, you, the easiest way is to put a capo on the first fret, tune your guitar as normal, take the capo off. You're in E flat. That's the, the easiest way to do it. Otherwise, just use a tuner and tune to E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, B flat, and E flat. It's pretty simple to do. Something that happens a lot in that kind of 90s uh, rock thing. So if you're into that genre, you've probably encountered this before. So I'm going to take you through, first of all, the chord grips, the way that it's played and some of the options for playing it. Then we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the rhythm and when to use palm mute, how to do accents and how to strum it. Because actually a lot of this, the energy from this song after the first verse and chorus is through strumming, not through like continuous down picks, which is how it's often played. And I think how I played it wrongly for a long, long time. Let's start off by going through the chords in the verse. I'm going to simplify the rhythm. A lot of the vibe here is a thing called a push, which is where a chord comes half a beat early. So it comes on the end after four instead of right on beat one. I'm going to remove that for now just in this simple explanation. It is one of the key kind of trademarks of the song. So it's something that I definitely encourage you to look into. But we're going to start by just simplifying that and looking at the chords, making sure we got the chords right. First of all, first one is an E power chord. So first finger is in the seventh fret of the fifth string and muting the thicker string. That's a really important job of the first finger there. Third and fourth fingers are playing the ninth fret and the middle two strings. First finger is also muting the thinnest two strings. So while we will be kind of accurate picking and palm muting, you should be able to strum all of the strings and have only the strings that are supposed to be ringing out, ringing out, and the rest muted. That's a fairly big deal. So mute, no, 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 mute, then a string, okay? That's the first chord, is an E. Then we go to a B, which means everything just moves up one string. So first finger's moved onto the seventh fret of the thicker string. Third and fourth fingers say relative, so two frets higher on the next two strings. Then we go to a C sharp. Five, C sharp power chord. So first finger is now in the fourth fret of the fifth string. Exactly the same rules apply. Thicker string should be muted, thin as two strings as well. Then we go to a G sharp. Still G sharp power chord. Then we go to an A. So one fret higher. Back to E. And then back to B. Okay, so that sequence. E, A, B, A, E. Up, then to G sharp, to A and then to E and then it's to B for two bars and again. So E is going to B, then C 
shop goes to G sharp, then A is going to E and it's going to B. Two bars. So that would be the first progression I would recommend that you explore. After you've learned the basic chords, you know what they are, then I would try and apply some palm muted chugging eighth notes. Okay, sounds great, doesn't it? So on the E, you want a little bit of palm mute there, just resting your palm right on the edge of the bridge, and then all down picks. If you've got too much palm mute, you're not gonna get any note of the chord, really. If you move it too far back, you don't get any, so it's... You're looking for that Goldilocks amount of palm mute. Maybe as a first step, you might play through that whole thing just with the palm mute. Nice, easy eighth note chugging. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two. That wouldn't be a bad exercise just to get to used to the palm muting. Make sure that your pick is going on the right strings. Getting used to the action not used to doing this kind of eighth note chugging thing you might find it a little bit difficult on the wrist it is just a practice thing developing the muscles so let's now talk about the push before we talk about accents because we also want to talk about accents but the pushes are one of those things that really kind of if you don't get the pushes in the right place it never kind of feels right for me and the first one is changing to the b chord so the cha first change from the e to the b the b arrives on the and after four <laughs> sharps on the beat but the G sharp is pushed A is on the beat E is pushed B is straight okay so there's pushes every two bars so E two three four and two three four C sharp two three four and two three four A two three four and two three Okay, so you've got that. The pushes happen from the E. There. C sharp, pushing to G. G sharp, run. A, E, B. E. There's the push. C sharp. A. Push. I always feel like it's being, like I'm being pushed in the back when I've got that little kind of lurch forward so that would be the first thing recognizing where the pushes come where the chord comes a little bit early half a beat early once you got that right then it's about looking at the accents and this is one of those things where i mean i played the accents wrong most of my life i've played this live in covers bands hundreds of times and no one's ever said oh you didn't do the accent right like it it depends on how fussy about it you want to be for me these kind of projects when i'm teaching you this stuff i want to try and get it right but to be honest if you put an accent on beat two and four, which is called the back beat, if you put that most of the way through and you get the pushes in the right place, it'll sound pretty much like it. So, um, I can't do it wrong now. I forgot the pushes because I'm trying to just accent two and four. This is the problem. I've been practicing it, trying to make sure that I get the accent right. And now I'm trying to show you how to do it wrong. That doesn't really work. What I'm getting to is if the accents don't come out exactly right, the same as the record, it really doesn't matter. No one's going to get hurt. Probably most people won't notice. I think it's worth practicing it to get it right because it'll sound just like the record and that's cool and it's a good thing to practice and it's a good uh, you know, way of developing your guitar skills if you work on these things, okay? So it's worth practicing, but don't worry about it if it goes slightly wrong. Don't stop, for God's sake. Like, you've got to keep it going even if things go a little bit shaky, right? So let's talk about where the accents fall now. So the first one, E, there's just an accent on B1. But on the B, when it's moved to the B chord, we've got that B pushed, so it's arriving on the and after four, and we've got an accent on beat two and four, the back beat. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. 
So there is a pattern here. It might seem a little bit complicated. It's the kind of thing that writing it down yourself will probably help. But we start on the E, there's not really any accents, but later on it fall, ends up falling on two and four. But two, three, four. So on the B, it's on beats two and four. When it goes to the C sharp, which falls on beat one, two, three, and four, and. So we have an accent on beat two, the and after three, and the and after four is where we change chords. So if I do it real slow, one and two and three and four and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and four and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and four and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. So that last bit where it's on the B chord there, uh, that does make a little difference. We've got beat two, the and after four, and then beat two and four. So one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. That's one of the key moments for me in that whole thing with that accent passage where it makes it sound like it's going right. From the E, one and two and three and four and one, two, Last time it just stays, the last time going into the next section, it just stays on that one chord. And we go into this bridge section, A. Sometimes I give myself the creeps. We've got that little, nice little pattern again, A. B is pushed with an accent on two and four, the E. Two, three and four, and one, two, three and four. That same little pattern that we had on the B with the accent on two, the and after four, and then two and four in the next beat on the E chord. One more time explaining. A, two, three, four, B is pushed, two, four, E, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. My, 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 play tricks on me. Then we're into this next sort of the thing i'm cracking up bit where it ch things change considerably at that point so uh this little i'm going to call it a b section uh a to b chord to e for two bars with the accents one, oh, one and two and three and four and one two three four two three four and one two the second time don't think there's any accents on that last little bit where it goes a b and then we've got where it really changes instead of having that palm muta thing it's going all out uh, you can see it's a lot more like strummy high energy sort of dancing around a bit rather than being quite so focused so that little part that goes down is going E, D, to a C sharp minor. So now we've got second finger down. It's like a C sharp power chord. But we put second finger down on the uh, fifth fret of the second string. And first finger is also playing fourth fret of the thinner string. You don't tend to hear that string so much, but you want to be holding that whole thing down. So it's going from power chord into a bar chord. Down, 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 up, down, down, down. At this point, things get a lot more strummy. Uh, and it's, so it'll be. You can see my hand looks more like I'm strumming an acoustic, you know, campfire kind of a song rather than a rock song, but that's, 
where that energy lift comes from like that. The rest of the drums and the band are still driving real hard. So the combination of that change and the, the driving band really lifts it up big time. It's, it's definitely a good thing to work on rather than just feeling like you have to do this kind of pumping eighth note thing all the time. And it gives you a bit of a rest. If you've been, you know, really focused your energy on the eighth notes there for so long, then by that time it comes to that, your arm's probably starting to get a bit sore anyway. So it's nice to be able to release it a little bit. So, um, E, B, C sharp. A, open chord, muted thin the string. I don't tend to target that C sharp note here, the one on the uh, the second fret on the second string. If you accidentally hit it, it's not the end of the world, but I wouldn't target it. Now the B chord, uh, Billy seems to play it with his first and little fingers. I, I can't quite do it the same way because my little finger's real short and it doesn't bend at that second joint. Some people's do and some people's don't. Uh, I might play B chord like that, but I have a way of playing a B where I kind of put my third finger on top of my little finger. I still manage to mute the thinner string somehow. I don't exactly know how that works. I, I wouldn't recommend that as a way to, to play the B chord. Do whatever feels comfortable for you. You could just stick with a, a power chord there if you find doing a full B bar chord awkward. That wouldn't make a whole heap of difference. Um, so A, B, now we've got this bit, E, B, C sharp minor to B. Rhythm here is four, one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one. So I'm actually, my hand is coming down, touching all the strings like a little mute. And one, two, and three, four, and one, two, up, down, mute, up, down, mute, up, down, mute, up, down, mute, up, down. Now I'm using an E. Very often I'm just letting my first finger relax a little bit. So instead of this, I'm taking that note away, just letting my first finger relax a tiny bit. Just sounds a little fuller, a little bigger to my ears. You don't have to do it that way. You can play regularly. I don't think it sounds necessarily bad, but um, yeah. Sometimes there's this. Literally a very quick down up down with the last down falling on the beat. And a one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and a one, two, and three. So it's starting here, four, and a one. It's and a one. So and is a down, and a one. Okay? Verse is the same, except instead of doing the power chords up here, we're going to use open E. Now, the G sharp, technically I guess it could be a G sharp minor if you were in the key of E. But it sounds horrible like that, to have the... She said my life's a bore. Bore, it sounds really twee. Bore. He's using like a blue note effect over that G sharp. So it's not really major or minor. And if you play minor, it just sounds really weird. It sounds too proper. The major, I think, sounds closer to what it is. But the, the truth is, it's a power chord. So you don't hear, if you listen closely, when he's playing that G sharp, you don't hear it's major or minor. It's the power chord. So even though you've got big chords, big chords, when he hits that, it's just the power chord still. Big A, B, and B. It's interesting because that, it isn't major or minor, and it's one of those key, another one of those little subtle things about the song, but if you get it right, it's like, oh yeah, sounds, he's got it going on. Like, they thought about that, the way he's played it. He's probably played the minor and the major and gone, oh, they both don't work. So he's realized that the power chord is the solution. Now, I don't know, obviously he wasn't in the room when they were writing the tune. 
But so the verse will be exactly the same. So E, B, D, C sharp minor to G sharp power chord to set A then to E, bring it me. Now just back the volume down just so you can really hear, clearly hear that strumming because it does get a little bit raucous in there. They've got a beautiful mix. I mean, Green Day record, uh, you know, I think it's a, like kind of Ocean Way. I'm not sure that's the studio they did, did uh, that record in, but uh, it's that level of quality, like really hi-fi sounds, beautiful, gainy sounds. So very clear. Uh, but when you're well, when I'm playing it, it all gets a little bit murky. So I'll just back the distortion right off, so you can hear, clearly hear if I can speak the rhythm there. I think the easiest kind of simplification of it is down, 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 up, 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 down, down, up, down, 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 up, 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 down, down, up, down, 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 up, 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 down, down, up, down, 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 up, up. Up, down, down, up, down. It's consistent. Two, three, and four, and one, and two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four, and one, and two, three, and four. See, it sounded weird there when I hit the minor. And two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four, and two, three, and four. Now I can't count properly. Continues A. Sometimes I give myself the breeze. Sometimes I play tricks on me. Still very strummy. It all keeps turning up. Back up for I think I'm cracking up. Am I just paranoid? Am I just on? Okay, just open A, eighth notes, B. So you better hold on. Another verse, but just instrumental. Just like we had before with the singing. But when we come back into it, sometimes I give myself the creeps. We're back into that section with, you know, the power chords with the same accents. In fact, I think I think the accents might be even different a little bit there. I haven't got that written out. Now, all of those parts are repeated. So, like I said, I think there are some variations on the accent patterns on that later one. I think it's mainly that lead guitar part that's doing those accents, not like the whole band. Occasionally they're getting picked up, but who's to know how that was, uh, whether it was structurally arranged like that or happy accidents, I'd, I'm not really sure. There's one other part though, which is nice, which is right at the end, which is this. Um... Again, it's one of those ones that I I only learned when I started learning this song for the lesson. It's a shame, really. I played it wrong a long time. Anyway, first finger, sixth fret on the fourth string, first finger, seventh fret on the fifth string. And then I'm just I'm just playing those two strings. Yeah, you can play the thicker string as well. I don't think it sounds as good. And then third finger is going down in the seventh fret of the fourth string. So you get a little E, sus four E. Then it goes to a C sharp power chord, but you're just going to use the two notes there. So the fourth fret on the fifth string and the sixth fret on the fourth string. The little finger is just going to go one fret higher than the third finger, so into the seventh fret of the fourth string. A, B, E, sus. 
C sharp with a sharp five A. And then you've got A, E, B to finish twice. And you're done. Now, there is a lot to learn in this song. There's a lot of accent passages, a lot of different ways of playing the chords. There's, uh, you know, making sure that you've got everything muted right, uh, that you're not lagging or pulling with this song. That it's kind of an easy one, I think, to, to try and rush ahead or fall a bit behind. So playing along with the record, you really want to practice trying to play in the groove with it, um, which is a great thing to be practicing, actually. So... There are lots of different levels to learning a song like this. You can learn it the most basic way. Just get the chords right, practice your palm mute and work your way through. If you're a beginner just approaching power chords, you could play this song and use power chords all the way through, not go to the open chords, not worry about C-sharp minor or any of that sort of stuff. Just play straight power chords all the way through with a bit of palm mute and you'd be able to play the song. It'd be recognizable. You could play it for your friends. You could even play it in a covers band and probably not many people would notice. If you want to take it that next step, you want to start looking at putting the pushes in where the chords come a little earlier, and then probably the accent passages as well, learning to play a little lighter and then having a bit of room volume-wise, dynamically, to, to put those accents in is a really important part of the growth of a, a rock guitar player so that you can, well, the accents are just a big, you know, that's a, a big thing, no matter what type of rock guitar, having a palm muter thing with accents and accent groupings and arrangements and patterns that the rest of the band pick up is a big part of the game you know in this song you've got that switch to the strummy sort of part where you do have to be aware of what you're doing and not letting it get too sloppy um, and it's a good exercise again and being able to make sure that the strings are muted that should be you know in the thing i'm cracking up bit where you're just playing a power chord but you're going to be strumming that and giving it a bit of welly you know um and one last thing that I think I should mention that I, I definitely struggled with when I first started playing this type of music in my teens was getting used to the volume. Now, right now I'm in like an office block and I'm just using tiny speakers. I don't even have an amp here at all. I'm just using my Kemper. Um, but if you're playing this sort of music and you want to play it in a band or you want to play it out, you want to get used to the volume well before you get to even a rehearsal studio, right? So practice, try and find a time when you can practice at home with a bit of volume and get used to what it feels like because strings ringing out funny and, and the way that your guitar reacts to a bit of volume can be quite terrifying if you're not used to it. So do spend a little bit of time working on playing it that way. You know, upset your neighbors a little bit and, and get the volume cranked up before you go to play it out at a pub. Um, what a cracking song. I really should have done it. Like, I think I did do a lesson on this years ago, like 10 years ago. One of my earliest YouTube lessons was on this song, but I didn't do a very good job of it, which is one of the reasons why I've redone it now. Um, I'm planning on doing a whole heap more of this pop punk stuff because I loved this music when I was in my early 20s, and um, I feel ashamed that I haven't done as many of those songs as I should have. And listening back to them now fills me with nostalgia and just the pure joy of playing along with it. And I hope that I'm going to share some of that joy with you guys because it's just awesome fun. So I'll see you for plenty more lessons very soon. If you're over on YouTube, I really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button, slap me a like, let me know what other Green Day songs you'd like me to do lessons on in the comments. I've got some in mind already, but maybe you're going to suggest me some others I hadn't thought of or I'd forgotten about. I'll see you for plenty more very soon. You'll take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.